Before we start, we want to thank you so much for listening to episode zero and for all the feedback we got from it. And make sure to follow us on Spotify and Anchor. Apple Music and YouTube will be up shortly after this episode. This episode, we're filming it together. And we know you'll be seeing this podcast later on. Today is Mid-Autumn Festival. So, happy Mid-Autumn Festival! (laughs) And thank you so much again, and let's get right into it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the UWARD Podcast. This is the podcast where we educate you, our listeners, through the exploration of different aspects of the housing crisis in Hong Kong. We're your hosts. Donald and Rachel Lai. So at the moment, the housing crisis in Hong Kong is one of the most severe issues that the city is facing. According to our researchers, about one in five people live under the city's poverty line. A nano apartment, also known as a tiny home in Hong Kong, costs civilians up to $500,000, and the monthly rent for half the city's apartments costs 2550 which is 122% of what the average Hong Kong citizen makes in a month. And even if you manage to rent out a flat, the uncomfortable and unlivable condition make their lives significantly worse. Yeah. So... There's a lot of factors that actually go into this, but the two main causes that we're going to be exploring today are firstly, government management, and secondly, supply and demand. So firstly, in terms of government management. To understand how the government affects the housing crisis, we have to first learn about these land developers. So who are these land developers? They're generally mainland Chinese immigrants and foreigners, but mostly mainland, who are willing to pay higher prices for land than lots of Hong Kong citizens can. What do land developers do then? The land developers drive up the prices of housing, usually through artificial shortages. So, for example, even though the mainland bidders only make up 7% of total purchases, the top bidders are often from the mainland and win roughly about 40% of these bids. Usually these houses aren't for them to live in, but actually for investments. So they hoard a lot of different houses in a lot of different places. Either way, they're forced to raise these prices to make a profit, which is in turn reflected in the price prices of renting apartments because of such high bids. Oh, I see. But why doesn't the government just take these lines back for themselves? Well, I mean, that's where government management comes in, right? The Hong Kong government actually manages and owns all of the land in Hong Kong. So that means the developers have to pay a land premium to the government, which leases the land out. Oh, I see. So the government leases and grants state land to the public plus the private entities for use. Yeah, exactly. So it's important to note that Hong Kong has really low taxes. And the reason for this is because the government gets a lot of its revenue from how expensive Hong Kong's land is. Well, why can't we just raise the taxes then? I mean, taxes have to be this low so that there's foreign capital and so corporations don't just move out of Hong Kong. Hong Kong's appeal is basically its low taxes, which creates this effective economy Hong Kong has. You can't just take it away immediately or else it hurts Hong Kong a lot. Economically and politically. This means that the government has really little incentive to cut costs. So, for example, like placing rent controls since they need to choose to protect the low taxes or the housing prices. They currently have chosen the taxes. So to profit, they're forced to then make the housing prices really high, and then the owners will rent it out for high prices as well. And the continuation of land sales and the concept of land premium implies that the government is prioritizing the economy over the actual living conditions of the people. From 2016 to 2020, the percentage of capital revenue in Hong Kong has remained at an average of about 26 to 27 percent of total revenue. So are you saying the government are unable to do anything then? I mean, they aren't at a standstill. They could be doing a lot more. In 1997, government halted public housing construction because of the financial crisis. And in 2006, the government decreased construction again from 3 million to half a million, but it has not resumed to what it was before. Luckily, though, some steps are being taken. Which we'll be exploring in later episodes. So, for example, the government wants 180,000 new private homes and 280,000 new public homes by 2027 and are doing more work with the land developers. But then you might be wondering, why can't the government just expand and use more land in Hong Kong? Here's where we get to issue of supply and demand. In Hong Kong's housing crisis, the supply is the amount of usable land for housing, and the demand is the demand of people for this land. You might be wondering, what is ready-made land? Well, ready-made land is basically flat land that developers or people who want to buy this land can build upon immediately because it's flat, and is stable. Over the past two decades, Hong Kong has not implemented any large-scale land development plans and that could be a real problem because as there is a dwindling supply of land, 
the demand for th this land will continue to rise because of the population increasing and this will also drive up the prices for law citizens making it barely affordable for a lot i mean there's got to be other land in hong kong why isn't that being used well one of the main reasons is because of the lack of ready-made land but fault doesn't just solely lie on the government well this is due to the hong kong's geography oh yeah if you look outside i mean hong kong has a lot of mountainous terrain and rocky paths yeah exactly and this is the reason for how only seven percent of the land in hong kong is used for building houses and that number has stayed for basically the same for 15 years and the reason for that is because of the lack of social consensus of whether to utilize the land and how the land should be used if it's such a big problem then why isn't there social consensus because an application for redevelopment usually takes around six years to approve and due to its complicated administrative approval procedure plus a give or take four to five years of construction okay so it takes a really long time then yes but not only that some projects may face opposition uh, from the public forcing a lengthy judicial review and this could be from residents raising concerns over project over noise um, impact on local traffic the environment because as you can see outside uh, there's a lot of mountainous terrain and it can cause some you know safety concerns for law citizens so these factors are also why the government has slowed down its land development redevelopment program well that's true but the problem just doesn't just lie here. Many coast-based countries face similar problems of lack of land. The issue is the ratio of people living in Hong Kong and the space we have, also known as population density. It's insane that we have over 7 million people. 7.5 million to be exact. And because Hong Kong's population is so high, this means there's an incredibly high demand for land. When you have a lack of supply, which is Hong Kong's ready-made land, but high demand, this means prices go up. This also means that of those 7.5 million Hong Kong citizens, 3.3 of them have to live in public housing because they can't afford the expensive private housing. For those who don't know what public housing is, it is government funded housing. Because there are so many people in need of public housing, the average waiting time for public housing is around 5.5 years. So what do they do in those 5.5 years? Well, with demand for public housing being so high and supply of it and land in general being so low, many turn to subdivided flats. And around 210,000 Hong Kongers live in these subdivided flats. So to our viewers who don't know what subdivided flats are, they're basically small apartments that land developers create to maximize profit because they want to squeeze the most they can out of big apartments. So they subdivide it and allow these apartments to house multiple families. But generally, these apartments are incredibly small. These flats are often unhygienic and very unlivable which is where we coin in our name uh, for our brand, Unlivable. So for example, they don't have proper sewage, they have the toilets in the same room as the kitchen, and this often leads to also uh, health hazards for the people that live there. And these flats can also take a mental uh, and physical toll on these uh, citizens who live there. Yeah, they're unventilated, they're windowless, they're incredibly hot, small, and sometimes people can't even stand up straight in these apartments. And these subdivided flats often raise safety concerns. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes there's the literal risk of collapse because of poor structural design. There's a lack of regulations on fire and electrical safety. So I think, for example, there was a fire in one subdivided complex in June of 2011 that caused four people to die and injuring 19. This means we need to take urgent action to help those in this situation right now. By donating through Unlivable's GoFundMe and as well as purchasing our future products. All of our proceeds will go to charities such as Habitat for Humanities HK, Impact HK, SoCo, and etc. You can also push for awareness by educating yourself more on the severity of this issue and spreading it to people in your own community. And you can do that by sharing our podcast to your loved ones, your friends, or even educating yourself on our website www.unlivablehk.org. As always, we'll be releasing episodes every other Saturday at 9 a.m. HKT, and you can always stay updated on our Instagram at the U Word HK. Be sure to follow us on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever else you get your podcasts. This episode was produced by Cynthia Huang and Shireen Tam. Special thanks to Aaron Foss, B. Sweeney, Christine Lam, and Nicola Wall. This episode was mixed and edited by Tanya Kim and hosted by Rachel Lang and Donald Ng. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye! Bye. Perfect!